Welcome to the Organic Wine Podcast. Hello, this is Adam Huss coming to you from Los Angeles, California. Thanks so much for listening. Hidalgo, Wetumpka, Norton, Cloeda. If you haven't heard these names before, they are American Heritage or American Native Wine Grape Varieties. And they're just a few of the dozens of native grape varieties being grown at TerraVox, or Vox Vineyards, just outside of Kansas City, Missouri. Missouri is the site of America's first and oldest AVA, by the way. So it has a long and fascinating wine history, which we get into in this interview. In the current American wine industry, built as it is on imported European varieties, these American native varieties haven't had much of a voice. But Jerry Eisterhold and Jean-Louis Corvillier are helping to change that. Jerry is the founder and proprietor of TerraVox, and Jean is the winemaker and vineyard manager. TerraVox means voice of the land. TerraVox is a living museum of the diversity of American native wine grapes. But more than that, it's an example of viticulture as a dynamic process. And while this interview is chock full of amazing insights and information, these are the two points that I hope you'll hear most clearly that fostering, preserving, and celebrating diversity is the key to creativity, innovation, and resilience, and that the best viticulture is a dynamic process built on the ability to continually adapt and incorporate diversity. Celebrating diversity in process-centered rather than varietal-centered viticulture are the keys to eliminating short-sighted decision-making and to building adaptability and resilience into the American wine industry. I want to thank Jerry and Jean for giving us a great example of how this can be done through TerraVox. Enjoy. Jean, Jerry, welcome. Thanks for doing this. Oh, thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks. Jerry, you are the the owner, proprietor, founder of of Vox Vineyards and TerraVox. And and Jean, you're the winemaker vineyard manager. And I know some people will have heard about you because you guys have done a pretty good job of, of getting out the word about what you're doing but you know i think there's a lot of people that haven't heard about you and i think what you're doing is pretty cool and unique and i I want you to if you could just sort of talk about what that is like why why are you guys special (laughs) uh well we're special because everybody's special but um (laughs) in in particular uh the, the um in my day job i design museums And uh, this kind of is an outgrowth of that, because in a way, it's kind of a, as much a, uh, has a mission of sort of cultural education as it does uh, about wine. Um, Now, nobody is going to want to drink a wine because it's culturally educated, uh, educational, but but still, it's, um, you know, making people aware of the value of something that can come from a particular place. Um, and uh, it's kind of an exploration of diversity too. It's just the idea that there's uh, there's things that remain to be discovered in in many dimensions of life, and uh, certainly Native American grapes are one of them. I I mean I I bet you you might be surprised to find that some people would like to try some wine just based solely on cultural uh, <laughs> a, a cultural heritage aspect. Um, so what are like what? You guys are growing how many different varieties of native grapes there? Uh, well, I don't really know, uh, but we started with about 60 and uh, kind of weeded it down to about 40, and we're trying to get down to around 20. And then we discovered a guy that was uh, breeding grapes from uh, more Native American grapes, so we collected another 25. So it's uh, while we're trying to tamp it down, it, it's, it's still, well, you know, if if you set off on a course to explore diversity, you got to kind of uh, you know, play the tune. And I say about 60 because when you get these, um, you know, for, in the main, these are things that you just can't go out to a nursery and, and buy. Uh, there, there are a couple that have little pockets of, of uh, you know, fans down in Texas and whatnot. But um, you get a bundle of cuttings and sometimes uh, two different varieties sure as heck look exactly the same. And sometimes mm. the same bundle will yield three different, clearly different grapes. And then you'll have a couple of things that will just pop up that you don't know where the heck they came from. So um, I have yet to actually get a hard number on how many varieties we have. So 
That's why there's uh, always that kind of fuzzy approximation. But I think, you know, the fuzzy approximation is also appropriate to what we're doing. <laughs> well, and you're making some pretty good wine from it. I mean, I just want to, I want to like steal your thunder, but you have some, you've, you've won some best in show with your Norton, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, you know, you have some just incredible track record with, uh, with getting recognition for the wines that you're making from those. Well, uh, two, two years running, if, uh, if I may say, I think, I think the first, <laughs> um, accolade I had, uh, and this is after being at it for about 10 years was from my French wife who, who announced, uh, over dinner that she would actually put this stuff in her mouth. And, uh, <laughs> that's when we knew that we were you know, on our way. I think you could have no higher award, honestly. That's pretty good. Yeah, I was going to um, print I, that on the label for... Well, I did print that on the label for a while. <laughs> I'd take that. I would just quit then. That's, I mean, and so I, I actually had, uh, I think, two two of those or two vintages, I, like a vertical of those. Maybe it was both of the, the winning ones. Um, and absolutely can say they're incredible stand up to anything being made out there it's uh anybody who hasn't tried native you know or has prejudice against native grapes uh, native american grapes um they haven't tried your wine it's incredible um and i i also had your fun sparkling sort of rosé made from america the grape named america um which i don't i i couldn't find anywhere else anywhere that grape so i don't know if you guys are the only people growing it but I could not find it anywhere. Yeah, I, I would think I would say that most of the grapes that we grow here uh, aren't found anywhere, at least commercially grown. There are a few, like you know, Norton has grown, and uh, you know, Lenore yeah. and Lamanto, and some of those have have. There are certain vineyards here and there, around the country, and frankly, around the world. But uh, yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a it's an odd grape, and even. You know, the thing that uh, started me on this was a book that I found uh, that was printed back in 1913 that talked about all these grapes. And they would say, oh, this makes a great wine. This makes a, you know, a, a good table grape, etc." cetera. And, uh, you know, um, for me, uh, being a you know, Missourian on the show me state, it's like, well, what the heck does that mean? But as to the America grape, um, there, the, that book and there are several other, other writings from like the 1880s that would... Uh, to talk about the America grape and all they would say is, boy, this sure is unusual. And I can't quite describe it. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, it's, I mean, you know, it, it tasted like, um, sparkling grape juice to me. I mean, I don't know how else to put it. Like, does that, does that ring true to, to you guys? Like, yeah. It, and the other, it, it, I mean, and again, um, where all these grapes were trying to find out sort of what their typicity is. So, we haven't like dialed in exactly what America was, but there was one year where it kind of tasted like meat. Yeah. Wild. Okay. Yeah. Which this is... was like, I mean, this looked like, this tasted sort of like a, a wine that could have been used to, as the flavoring for grape flavored candy. You know, it was that kind of grapiness. Um, if, if, I don't know, I, I don't know if I'm yeah. ringing well, you know, any bells that... for you guys, if you've heard that. Yeah, but that, that brings up a point that a lot of time people are doing wine tasting. They say, oh, this is, you know, redolent of uh, citrus or strawberries or plums. No one hardly ever says, boy, this tastes like grapes. <laughs> right, exactly. I know. <laughs> um, well, it's, it, you know, before we get too far into this, where are you guys? Where, where are you located we are located on the rolling Los Hills uh, north of Kansas City, Missouri. And it's my understanding, I haven't traveled the whole world, that these, uh, these wind-deposited low soils, that the major formations are here uh, along the Missouri River, uh, along the Yellow River in China and in East Germany. So there's, there's that aspect of, being, of having very deep um, mineral-rich soil without a lot of organic matter in it, which is one of the reasons that we uh, kind of latched onto this place to, to try this little experiment. And... Are there other vineyards around you? Are you are you unique in that area? Uh, pretty much. There are others in the adjacent counties, but they're, you know, they're uh, in other. I'm I'm racking my brains, and if I have to uh, print a retraction, I'll let you know. But I I don't think there are any others that are kind of rooted in the low soils that we are in. Okay. 
But is there any other soil type that you can compare that to? Is it sort of like the gravelly banks of the of of Bordeaux kind of? style or uh, is it no it's it's well if you um if you've uh, studied your soil science there uh-huh. are uh, three categories of soil particle one is clay which is the, the teeny tiniest one is uh-huh. uh, silt which is the mid-sized and there's sand and so this is all silt it's all silt all the way down because these are oh, wow. these are wind deposited soils that were um so the edge of the ice sheet at the uh, from the, the last glaciation was basically where the Missouri river is today Uh because that's where all the meltwater was, you know, coming, finding its way down to the Mississippi. So as the ice sheet retreated, you know, it left the, there was this bare unvegetated, the pulverized uh, stuff that the, that the glacier had ground down and uh, would the wind would pick it up because it wasn't held down by anything. Uh, There would be trees though, growing where the river had been flowing because, you know, they had years to establish so the trees would act as a windbreak and kind of drop out the soil particles. And you'd have uh, deeper deposits of larger silt particles right by the river. And then it gets thinner and thinner and finer and finer as it goes across uh, the county into the next county. Interesting. Okay. So it's basically yeah, it's... sorted stuff. Most, most like silt loams is a mix of clay and silt and sand. Uh, we're, we, are, we have been uh, you know, sorted through a fine sieve. <laughs> that's fascinating but um missouri has a pretty long i, I you know a, a lot of people don't know this but missouri has a pretty long wine history um do you, are you you know a, a buff when it comes to missouri wine history can you is talk about that buff? at all of course he is <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah that's the other thing because there's there's a um uh there's uh, there are books that are published about the German um, heritage in the Midwest, and you know the Germans in particular. Not, I mean, I, well, yeah, I guess I am t- kind of tooting the heart. They they had a particular long view of things, and they were very systematic in their approach to many things in life. Uh, you know, to a fault sometimes, but you know, what, whatever. Um, right. So, like researching the guys that, uh, and they were all guys uh, that. Oh, I don't know. I mean, the Missouri State Etymologist is the, is the person that worked with Emil Planchon to identify the phylloxera uh, bug and what it was and, yeah. that, and that it established that it was the cause of killing the, the, the vines in Europe. There's others that were, uh, you know, sending the rootstock over to Europe. Uh, there's others that were breeding grapes, uh, some of which we have here. And, uh, you know, some of the vines we have, we have from the vineyards that these people established. Uh, others wow. uh, went on to farm to found the uh, systematic uh, school of, of viticulture at Davis, um, and uh, yeah, so on and so forth. So I mean, there's a, a whole raft of pioneers. There's about a half a dozen that have grapes named after them that were bred by this guy named Thomas Volney Munson, whose bu- whose right. uh, book I read, who is kind of credited with uh, figuring out how to save the the vines of, of Europe, the vitifera vines from the uh, phylloxera pest. Right. And what well, isn't Missouri the the place of the first AVA in America? Yeah, Augusta, Missouri, which is where, you know, we got some of these uh, old vines. That's amazing. I love that. <laughs> um well, yeah, I mean you just sort of tapped into it, but maybe both of you can sort of talk a little bit more about your own sort of personal backgrounds and philosophies that that brought you here um i mean obviously founding this you know you 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 brought up your museum history and having read munson's book um i mean feel free to flesh that out and then john if you want to sort of talk about your role and how you ended up there as well that'd be great well i'll um um uh, yeah so so um as i said i design museums and and spent a lot of time in old bookstores in the uh Stumbling across this uh, book that Munson wrote was was quite accidental, and just reading it, and in it, in it he described, um, and this is another reason for being in Missouri, there were 31 genuses of grapes that he identified on the planet, of which 27 of them grow in the Midwest. So we have more genetic diversity here because we're the overlap of the you know the plains, the glaciated areas, the woodlands, the Mississippi Delta, the Ozark Highlands. So there's all these ecozones that that merge or, or uh, abut one another here. 
So for freshwater fishes, uh, songbirds, and grapevines, this is kind of where you want to go if you want to uh, like touch on all on on the vast diversity of all these uh, lineages. And um, mm. buying that book, it was uh, purely a question of, uh, oh, I wonder what that's all about. And uh, then following out the consequences, I will. I sometimes say, and I'm not sure if this is appropriate for your podcast audience, that if uh, you know, probably if I'd fallen into, I don't know, drugs or gambling, it would have been a lot cheaper in the long run. <laughs> but uh, but you know, here we are, and now I can't afford uh, any of the other vices because I'm kind of committed to this one. Well, what what was your where did you get this value of diversity? Why why is that part of your life? Uh, gee. Um, well, uh, in the museum job, um, and I mean, th- this isn't this isn't the cause. This is just another effect. But uh, there's a um, we've we've done probably more civil rights museums than anybody else in the country. Of the uh, there was a HuffPost article about six civil rights museums that every American should see, and I did four of them. And one of our yeah. associates did the fifth one, and the sixth was done by a competitor who convinced them that uh, we couldn't possibly have any any more ideas, but. Really, it's um, <laughs> the whole idea of diversity and exit. Um, I mean, uh, I won't go too far into history, but John Stuart Mill, you know, is one of the philosophers that's credited with informing uh, the founding fathers about liberty and, you know, do, do, what, do what you will, but don't harm anyone else. That's was sort of the second mm-hmm. chapter of his treatise. The third chapter was a celebration of eccentricity. And it said uh-huh. that all creativity and uh, you know has to come out of individual ex- uh, well eccentricities. So you got to I mean if you're going to progress and move forward, you it, it can't come from the canonical mass. It has to come from around the edges. Mm. So there, yeah, there's there's right. an imperative there to um, to do that in in all walks, not just the wines. But you know the wines is kind of a low threshold. Um, it's a more fun way to do it than lecturing someone on, uh, you know, affirmative, <laughs> exactly. uh, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. And it's funny that Mills, uh, not often quoted for the celebration of eccentricity, but that sounds really fascinating. I want to yeah. learn. Well, you know, greatest hits and all that, they kind of forget the, uh, the other, the next chapter. Yeah. Um, yeah. Exactly. You know, so John, uh, I don't know. He bumped in. Well, let's see. Um, we, uh, uh, we we bumped into Clark Smith, who I don't know if, how far the, the, he will come up in this conversation, and uh, as kind of a consultant, and uh, and Clark bumped into John, and uh, John said, uh, "Well, you know, he yeah, came so, up here." Yeah, I was at a wine symposium actually in Texas, and this was my second one. I was kind of getting out of that green role and really taking the industry seriously because you know this is a passion and a dream come true for me. So I ran into Clark. Uh, I was the young one around and we talked. I shared my ideas and my passion and I guess we kind of just hit it off really well. And then a few weeks later when I called him about any other exciting opportunities, actually serendipitous, it was kind of, uh, so I talked to him. I was like, are there any opportunities you have for me? Is there something on your horizon that you know of? And then he said, that's funny, 15 minutes ago, I just got off the phone with this guy in Kansas City who's working on a really cool project how's your lab work? And right from there, I got the interview and that's kind of what set the ball rolling of me moving from Texas to Kansas city. That's nice. What, what was the importance of the lab work to this job? I think that was just like a basic, like, you know, where, right. where are you with your wine education? And at the time I got was working at my Texas tech uh, wine cert. Well, I'll, I'll back that up a little bit because here, to, uh, as I said, uh, several times already, I already have a day job. So the winemaking, yeah. Um, was all pretty casual. It's kind of, you know, what you could do over the weekend with friends and neighbors and, uh, you know, the old Huck Finn uh, trying to convince your friends it's fun and then next season you have to make friends because they discovered it's a lot of work. Um, yeah. But, uh, uh, you know, so uh, the, the, we were talking to Clark about how that we, if we're going to get real about this, you know, we have to get systematic about what the heck we're doing. We had... Um, Oh, I, the, one of the stories we had, uh, so Norton, Norton is one of the grapes that will hang on the vine for a long time. So I think one year we had tw- 26 different vintages because, you know, you pick some one Saturday and then the next week and the next weekend. And Clark came wow. up and did a blend of those. Um, 
and brought it back to his Appalachian America, and it got a double gold. And I think Dick Peterson said it was the best, uh, finest Norton he'd had in America, et cetera, et cetera. But I had no friggin' idea how it got to be that way. <laughs> so uh, that's when it was like, yeah, you know, we should probably try to at least, you know, document whatever the hell we're doing and, you know, maybe take some pH measurements or something like that. Well, you might have gotten lucky, but it could also be a testament to the quality of that grape. I mean, uh, now that John's there, who knows what you'll do? You might, you know, it might be, you you, <laughs> you might win the judgment of Paris with a Norton at this point. Well, who, who knows um, what we will do is exactly what we're trying to address. <laughs> um. Well, John, what was your what appealed to you about this project when when you learned about it? Well, it was a few things. So one factor was, you know, not selfishly, but selfishly, I was really looking for an opportunity to prove myself and kind of show like this dream that I have is is can very much be a reality. But from the start, so I grew up. So background, uh, I'm part French, part Nicaraguan, and I was born and raised in Houston, Texas. And I had a pretty good exposure to wine, having uh, French and Hispanic parents and having access to wine and, and, and really appreciating like the thought and the time that went into it. Um, I wanted to go outside of the cabs, the pinots. I wanted to try something that was totally different. So one of the first grapes I really dove into were Tempranillo and Viognier. And then uh-huh. sometimes some of the, you know, uh, Tariga Nacional, Alicante Boucher, those really piqued my interest. And then as it was, you know, meeting Jerry and then meeting Clark, um, finding out that these grapes, I remember the day I interviewed, uh, Jerry asked me, how many grapes have you worked with? And at the time, I think I counted 21 or 22. And he kind of smirked and said, well, we have like triple that. So I was <laughs> very much excited for that just because, you know, you know, looking at the grapes, you know, how globular the berries can be and with the tasting profiles and how it's really unique and completely different than anything you've ever tried. And the kind of thoughts that go in your brain, the feelings that you kind of experience with these grapes, you know, that really is, you know, the biggest thing that tied me in. That's great. Yeah. That sounds, I know that sounds like a, an amazing opportunity for me as well. I, I mean, I, I hope I, I would salivate at that as well. Um, and it's a good transition to talk a little bit more about those grapes. I mean, can you talk since you're the vineyard manager, can you give us a sort of overview of the vineyard, how big it is, you know, how it's sort of laid out? You guys have a, I mean, we'll just plug your website right now because you have a really cool map of the entire vineyard with, you know, I mean, some of your varieties, you have a single row through the vineyard. Can you just sort of, but give us an overview and sort of give okay. us a, sure. a um, picture of that. Well, rolling hills. So, um, the original planting, which took about 16 years to co- you know collect the vines and get uh, uh, the goal was like 12 vines of each, so you have you know wow. a couple of gallons, so you can at least see if it makes a good wine. And right. um, you know when the when you do an experiment, sometimes the answer is no. And right. uh, you know the, one of the reasons the wine is is good is that the wine that is bad is just goes down the drain, and you have to just be rigorous about that. Uh, right. We're also uh, so what we're doing right now though is once you discover one that you think has promise, uh, you have to propagate it, and propagating means we got to do it because you can't just go back to the you know to the store and get more. Um, and as we're doing that though, we're trying to do um, a kind of A/B testing. Like here's a eastern slope, here's a southern exposure, here's uh, the top of the. The, the soils at the top of the hill and the bottom of the hill and the shoulder of the hill will be distinct from one another because at the bottom, you got a little more moisture. It's been collecting organic matter over the years that rolls down. And and um, those vines, besides each vine having its own slightly different personality, each of those locations will yield a slightly different growth characteristic. Um, sure. There's, there's, uh, there's one called Volney. So Thomas Volney Munson, I mean, he named it after himself so he can well that's probably a good um uh, thing we 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 had one survivor that was just a scraggly little thing uh on on a particular plot of ground moved it down to the bottom where it's it's got more consistent moisture and it's it's you know just the most vigorous thing you could ever imagine but these these varietals are all different in their growth characteristics in terms of vigor and shyness and uh uh, and all that, and how much uh, you know, how dense the canopy is, uh, how open, 
um, and on and on and on. So there's it's uh, keeping track of all these hundreds of variables, which is one of the things uh, John's trying to uh, document and get a handle on. Yeah, did you want to add to that, John? Yeah, um, yeah, to sort of backpack off that. Uh, so if you pull into the property, right when you pull into the driveway, uh, immediately to your left uh, is the east block, and that block was planted in 96. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was, I always call it when I give tours or I talk about who we are and what we do, I always call that like our Genesis plot, so to speak. So that's kind of where the uh-huh. shovel went in the ground first and the first plantings no, went yep. down. And, and um, when was that again? How old is the vineyard? That, that part of the vineyard? Yeah. 96, okay. Yep. And uh, from there, uh, once Jerry got a better idea of what grapes work and kind of satisfy typicity and, you know, how much more can we stretch out? you know, wine styles in the winery uh, in 2000 kind of manifest destiny west towards, uh, you know, more blockage or I guess square footage. Blockage is not a good thing. Acreage but. rather <laughs> make it more appropriate acreage. But yeah, those different blocks, we have the East block, which is the Genesis block, the center block and the West block. And then uh, all in all, that's about seven acres. Then I would say what, four years, four and a half years ago, five years ago. Five years. Five years. We extended seven more acres. And uh, basically the grapes that, as we've now dubbed it, the flagship grapes, flagship wines that, you know, we've pretty much, this is how the wine's going to be from here on out, uh, kind of just spread more of them out into the into the vineyard. And uh, yeah, we're already seeing beautiful fruit on it. And this past year, we had quite the increase in our yields. Um, so the interactive map that you're talking about, uh, can be found at voxvineyards.com. And I think we're also going to add another domain to it, uh, terravox.wine. And, um, yeah, that's pretty much, you know, the, no, yeah, that, well, that, that brings up that, the, just that quick question I was thinking of, which was, I, I've, I've been using Vox Vineyards or Terravox interchangeably and, Teravox meaning the voice of the land and, and obviously like it, the vineyard itself is speaking Vox vineyards. Um, what do you, how, is there a difference between those two things? Is it, is like no. one, the well, there, wine there, label and one? There isn't, but I, um, we had one of my uh, compatriots from uh, the art Institute come up and, and kind of, you know, just to kind of do an assessment of how we're presenting ourselves. And he said, basically that we were just confusing people. <laughs> uh, they are interchangeable, so we're we're going to land on TerraVox because that's a little bit more descriptive than um, you know just Vox Vineyards. Um, right. And try to use that consistently in, in the website and the email addresses and all that stuff. The, the one will still alias over to the other because we had been using Vox Vineyards because that's kind of what we started with. But uh, we're we're going to we will eventually figure out and try to get our act together. <laughs> no, that's fine. I I I I wasn't. Well, I guess I was confused, but not in any way that prevented me from enjoying what I was seeing. Um, <laughs> well, and, and tasting. Speaking of which, the 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 vines. Uh, what are you guys finding? I, I, I have a I have a question first of all. So, with all of these native grapes that people have never heard of before, you must get some interesting interactions with yeah. wine drinkers and I'm, I'm wondering if you have any stories or or even just like what are, what are some of the most common questions that you guys get that you have to field on a regular basis oh man there's so many uh i i often find myself telling people that you know it's not really polite to sound so damn surprised <laughs> <laughs> yes yes uh it's funny <laughs> that's a good one i've i've actually been in that position of being like wow this is actually really good and they're like um yeah thanks <laughs> like uh that's funny yeah but I, do you guys do tastings there as well i mean people oh, are, yeah people... yeah we have okay. uh, two locations so we uh on site at the estate so by appointment only but we certainly wouldn't want to shoo anybody away if they showed up uh we have a tasting room overlooking the vineyard um, and then we also have another one that we've partnered up with, Greener Farm Creamery, located in Weston, which is just a short 15-minute drive from here. And, uh, yeah, those are the two prime locations to uh, really get the exposure to what we're doing here. 
And are, do you do you find people come and just right off the bat they're like, wait, you don't have Cabernet or you don't have, you know, like you don't have something that they're familiar with and yeah. you have to sort of do an education thing right up front? Yeah, there's there's a few things like whether I'm off site or on site, I've done a few things like I try not to use the word this is like a cab, this is like a Pinot. Right. More of like I talk about who we are, what we do and what kind of makes us unique and kind of talk about the rarity of these grapes and how wonderful of a story this is. So yeah. I talk about the grape first and then after a few glasses, they catch themselves saying like, Oh, it is like a cab. And then they kind of catch themselves and like you know, <laughs> self correcting almost. So with right. you, it's, it's more about once you're here and once you try the wines and you kind of get the, you know, for lack of better words, understand the vibe and the feeling, you know, the feel that's out here, really, that's when, um, you know, the message kind of hits home. Yeah, but you're right that uh, educating is is something that's really important. Well, it's critical uh, because, um, well, because I mean, people need to understand, you know, basically the conversation we've had for however long, it's, you know, they need to get that in, uh, you know, in five minutes to understand right. why this is different and unique and important. How do, if, how do you do that? If you think about that, it, if uh, people don't go into restaurants and say, yeah, give me a Wetumpka, because they have no idea what a Wetumpka is or even that it exists. <laughs> yes, someday. This is our goal. But yeah, so how do you do that? How, I mean, what, what, what do you say if I come in and I'm like, oh, I've never heard of this or what, you know, what's going on here? Well, if, if the... you're here, we can, uh, we can probably get you interested in what's going on. Uh, just it, try this kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, just, you know, <laughs> you go out, you look out over the vineyard, you, you see that there's more varietals out here than you can shake a stick at. So that starts people thinking about, I wonder uh, what all this stuff is about. And, you know, from there you can kind of tell the story. Yeah. And How many different wines are you? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. John. Oh, I was just going to backpack off that. If it's off site, the very first question I ask is, Hey, we're Terravox. Have you heard of us before? And I know they're going to say no. And from there, it's, I have like a 45 to like a minute spiel and they pretty much are like, okay, yeah, that's, let's try some wine. They're, they really want to jump onto it quickly after that. And yeah, I guess what, what is, what are the, how do you do that? I mean, like, how do you in the, you know, the, what we call the elevator pitch in Hollywood, what is mm -hmm. the elevator pitch for TerraVox? So it, pretty much starts off like, you know, have you heard of TerraVox? This is who we are. Um, I tell them a little bit about the story about the, uh, you know, Munson, Phylloxera, and then since being in Kansas City, a lot of the things that's really trending as, as far as like uh, recreation is the history behind Prohibition. So I, I touch into a little bit about Prohibition. And from there, I bring in kind of roll out this is, you know, Jerry, he's the owner, he's a founder. We found these grapes and uh, you know, propagated them from the start and then tie that into the wine. And once the wine is discussed and I, I see that natural questions come up, that's when the wine kind of starts pouring. And then from there, it's it's excitement and, you know, wonder. Yeah. But uh, I mean, to the to um, like Uber answer your your question. I mean, there, we have a number of narratives that we've developed over time. But you know, right now we got like a a PowerPoint that's half a gig with all all this stuff. So you test out the cultural history, you test out the locality, you test out the diversity, you test out the food and wine connection, or just you know being out here in the Missouri sun and uh, see where their eyes glaze over or where they are, they, you know, where they have a little gleam in their eye where they start to get interested in it. Yeah. And do you have, I mean, we, we talked about this uh, before we, we started recording, but a little bit about how careful you have to be with the language that you use. What, you know, can you talk a little bit about that? Just how do you, how do you keep from, you know, being referential to something that you are trying to be distinct yeah. from? Well, I think the main or one of the main things is the whole confusion. Of, well, they need to understand that this is a, a that there are three basic tracks for growing wine grapes. One is the vinifera, and most people have no idea that there's you know vinifera, and then there's other stuff. So that's one. Right. And then the other is most of the hybrids that are grown in other Missouri vineyards are the you know Vidal and the Chamberson and things like that. 
and trying to keep the language, uh, be very careful to use hybrids for those guys and her- American heritage for what we're doing because they are direct producers. But, you know, people don't really understand what direct producers means. They have all been bred from a variety of strains. So technically they're hybrids, but we just don't, don't want to use that language because it, we, we just need to make those three categories clear because that defines by default, you know, what our, what our lane is versus the other lanes. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, well, wh- what's working for you guys? What, what is, what have you, what are you finding in the vineyard and, and in the winery that you're, you're loving and that you're building more of, you're planting more of? So my first year here, I was kind of trying to calibrate exactly like, you know, what would Munson say about these grapes? You know, what, how would he, how would he like to see these turn into wine form? What styles of wine? And then after, you know, thinking and pondering and trying wines, you know, one of my favorite examples was Hidalgo. Um, before okay. it was made in, you know, amber style or just straight up dry with no MLF. Um, we tried MLF and we just, we loved it. You know, it, it makes a great standalone single varietal. It makes a great, uh, you know, example of the Chateau Chateau, which is a, a two wine blend. Um, so it, after, you know, talking about typicity, after we figured out the MLF was an answer, then we kind of, you know, it's not so much like granular. We want to change the yeast up dramatically. We pretty much, we really like what the previous winemakers and, you know, the choices I've made, we really like that, you know, parameter, so to speak. Um, uh-huh. So like, you know, that, that's one example, I suppose. Um, okay. And then with I mean, Norton, in... obviously. Oh, yeah. It's, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so Norton, you know, that's another example. Of Wata- or actually, you want to talk about Wetumpka? Uh, well, so the Wetumpka is, is um, a grape that um, when it's ripening out in the vineyard, the whole world smells of elderberry flowers, so it's incredibly aromatic. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, it shatters really easily, though, so when it's ripe, you, you better get out there and get it or it's gone and it's it's very, very pulpy. Uh, we had a farm, a, a, uh, one of those bladder presses uh, uh, in the farmer iteration where uh, you, know, you put that stuff in there, you turn on the bladder, and then you have to like back up fifty feet because you'll be everything around will be squirted. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, there's there's reasons that some of these grapes are just pains in the asses, and and maybe that explains uh, something about their limited. But um, that grape has enough. Uh, so one of the tricks is to figure out how to capture those aromatics as, as, as well as possible. And the other we discovered, and this was, a, I think, Clark's suggestion, that um, it has enough a sort of structure and acid to withstand fortification. So we're making a white port out of it. That is, oh. that is if I, I mean, that's the one that you put that in front of people and it, and it gets their attention because they just never had anything like it. That sounds incredible. Yeah. Wow. Well, and then Norton, and Norton is a pure native as far as we know, right? Or do you know more about that than I do? Virginia, right? Uh, as far as we know, yeah. Once called Virginia Seedling. Um, brought Estevelis to, is the, is, it's Estevelis, right? Yeah, yeah. And brought to, brought to Missouri wrong? by um, uh, was it, Jacob Rommel, <clears throat> who uh, there's a grape we have called Rommel that was named, bred by Munson, named after him. Uh, Rommel also bred, uh, created the Elvira grape, which is the gr- the main grape that's planted on the Azores. Oh, okay. Which is Wild. A, which is a side story. We're kind of thinking we might want to go out there and visit them, but um, yeah. that was kind of a digression. So we go back to Norton because we're also because we have enough of that to play with. We're kind of yeah. deconstructing it, you know, making a rosé out of the juice and then making a wine out of the stuff that remains and playing with ports and things like that, just because we have something to play with. And then there's a couple of rosé styles that come off of that. Yeah, we have the Saunier version, which isn't, you know, okay. made in true Saunier, where macrox, uh, macro-oxidizing. And then we have just, you know, more of the reductive form of that um, called the Sunny Slope. And then last year, or for the 2020 harvest, uh, I made a Petna out of it, and it Turned out to be really nice. You know, it's it's always scary making pet nuts. I think most winemakers would, I guess, agree oh, yeah. with me, you know. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's different ports, different rosé styles. I think we have uh, one, two, three lots of the Norton Reds. And then, yeah, the pet nut I just mentioned. That's nice. Uh, I mean, can uh, so Norton 
how does it grow? It's it's small clusters, as I understand. It's not super productive. Is that correct? Well, what are you um, finding? Yeah, it's small clusters. So here is, um, you it's know, very so I was out dark, in the vineyard right? with Clark, and uh, I forget who Clark called, but it's someone that had worked with Norton. So a lot of the grapes are trained as uh, cordon uh, pruning, and if you know your pruning styles. And uh, this guy had uh, divined that the Norton uh, puts out the best fruit from canes and puts out the better fruit from the, the, the first, second, and third buds will be not as productive as the, as the fourth, fifth, and sixth ones farther out. So oh, wow. we're uh, laying down a couple of canes and getting more fruit farther out away from the trunk than near the trunk. Huh. So that's a little thing that, down. Yeah. Thanks for telling me because it would have taken a while to figure that out. <laughs> yeah, um, that's great. That's I'm glad we got that in, <laughs> on the recording. Yeah, here. And, that, and that really ramped up because you know you basically have double the uh, the buds out there, and it's but it's a very very vigorous grower as opposed to some of the other uh, uh, varietals. Yeah. Oh, okay, it is okay. That's good to know. How how would you describe the the color and then the resulting flavor of like if you make a red out of it the reds that you know your double golds and things like that how for somebody who hasn't had it yeah I mean right off the press um, even right off the crusher it's just going to stain your hand it's so dark and you know one of the philosophies that I've kind of learned as I started out was I really not trying to make a Norton taste like a a Nebula or a cab or whatever, you know, I'm not really trying to manipulate it in that way. I think more of the philosophy is about um, what is this grape trying to be and kind of put a microphone and let it speak. So to speak, you know, that's kind of like the philosophy behind the winemaking in terms of it to that. I'm not adding a brand new French barrel or, you know, European or American Oak barrel. I, I really want the Norton grape to kind of go as it you know wants to go. So, you know, it's a lot of neutral barrel aging, um, you know, right off the press, it has this beautiful, like peppery, uh, sort of smell. If you were to grab all the stems and, you know, the jacks, it has that, you know, initial aromatic, and then as the juice, you know, precipitates, you know, during, you know, if you have collect the juice, separate the, the gross leaves and, you know, throw that into the what's remnant of the fermentation, um, it really lightens up a lot. You know, a lot of it precipitates out and it's not just because of bentonite or any kind of fining additions or anything like that. Um, it just it really just... has a, I don't know, it, it almost seems like it was meant to be grown here. Huh. And yeah, I mean... It, it... So you're, how are you making it? So you're, you're just, are you doing a whole cluster? Or are you, are you just oh. stemming and then? Yeah. So initially, you know, I crush into stem and then depending, well, we just got a new press. So we're still trying to calibrate exactly how much and how long we want to press for. But I think we, we, we nailed it pretty well this year, but you know, initially we want to take the, the juice off and not, not to the point where it's completely, you know, just dried pumice, but we want to take enough juice off to ferment the juice or, you know, cold soak or prepare, prepare it any sort of way. And then everything that's left, uh, or if we just want to ferment on the skins, I really like doing open bin fermentations with keeping, you know, mm-hmm. a, a, a nice blanket or some kind of fly preventing, you know, uh, blanket underneath the, the, the bins. And then, you know, the fermentations last from anywhere in general about one to two weeks. And then after that, uh, you know, play a with a lot of green chips with the fermentation. And then after we press, uh, you know, seeking out the MLF and then pretty much barrel aging. And what, what we found with Norton is, um, as I talked about the, the barrels, but it really likes its time in barrels and it really likes its time in bottles as well. So mm. we uncovered some of the wines from 2014, 2015, 2016. We try to revisit those you know, as often as we can. And, you know, they just, they surprise us. They change so much. I mean, that's, that's the whole thing, right? Uh, wine's a living, breathing thing. So yeah. Um, yeah. That's, a, does that answer, answer your Norton question? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think so. I, I, I had sort of a random question here. Do you have varieties that are sexed where you have to have a male vine out in the vineyard to, for pollen sake? because they're, they're sexed vines? Uh, not anymore. <clears throat> there there okay. were a couple in the, uh, in the first tranche of uh, things that we planted, but they just you know, were not uh, productive enough, so uh, out they went. Okay, got it. 
All right. So Norton is self-fruiting then. It's yep, good to yep. go. They're all perfect and flowers. Nice. Um, have you guys experimented with any vines from seed? Johnny Appleseed <laughs> style, Johnny <laughs> Grapeseed style? I think we both looked at each other and... <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's another bunch of those. And, and you know, we don't have enough bandwidth or even... I mean, I, those guys are bread grapes when they go in with little tweezers and the... Ah, uh, um, but there's enough seedlings that came down that we took a few mm-hmm. rows and dedicated them to uh, to seedlings. So Any, um, anything interesting happened yet? Anything well, to talk about? yeah. I mean, uh, last year we only had some, uh, you know, I don't know, half a dozen that you know produced fruit. The rest are still in abeyance. But uh-huh. uh, yeah, we made tiny little batches, and uh, you know, kind of looked at each other, and they're it's it's mm-hmm. interesting stuff, and and it's um, you know the seeds from a particular grape don't necessarily come up, uh, no, nope. you know, the same. Right, right. Yeah, every every seed has slightly different genetics, right? I mean, it might sort of have some simi- a lot of similarities, but you're essentially getting a new. A new, a new vine, a whole yeah. new vine. So it's right? a, you know, it's definitely a crapshoot. But uh, you know, at this point, we're so far into crap shooting that what's another roll of dice? Yeah, you guys are the perfect ones to take a crapshoot. <laughs> uh, I'm glad you're doing that. That's great. I, I think. I mean, I honestly think what you guys are doing is is the future. Like, uh, it's you know, I mean, you're you're doing the hard work for the rest of us who are going to come along and be like, oh, well, they figured it out at Terravox. You know, these these things work, and they, you know, yada yada, and you know, things that you guys are growing from seed will be the, uh, well, the cloned. So there, I'll, I'll say two, two things to that. One one is that one of the things that attracted me to the Munson book initially was besides the grape that he was also an inventor and a philosopher, and he had this whole idea that um, it wasn't enough to just have something in your head. You had to actually work it out in the real world. And, you know, there, mm-hmm. there are people that there, are, you, will, you will see books coming out now that are all about that, that it's not just uh, your brain, it's your, your body, your environment, your interactions and so forth. So, so there's the whole idea of dynamic agriculture and things that things are not fixed uh, in perpetuity that you still need to work with this stuff going forward. And then the, the other is the, um, oh, I don't know, the sort of the limitations of planning and thought. In fact, I've, uh, I've actually been brought into a business school to do a little talk about just um, if, you, if you put out uh, performers and spreadsheets and all this stuff, at some point, you just got to stop and do it. And if you think too much about it, you would never do it in the first place. So uh, I'm not sure if that's a good life lesson for everybody, but because uh, sure as hell, if we had thought about this uh, 20 years ago, I, I could have bought a hell of a lot of really good wine instead and just sat in my, you know, and sat and drank it. But, um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's more interesting I'm glad, this way. I'm glad you didn't. And, and if, let me, let me try to clarify what I think you were saying and tell me if I'm wrong. I, I think what you're saying is the work that you're doing is not an attempt to land on a new version of Cabernet that, that happens to be a native American grape. You, what you're saying is, this is an ongoing process. You aren't doing, you aren't laying a foundation. You are just showing the way for the process that we need to continue forever to continue to adapt and change and, um, you know, make agriculture a dynamic living thing that will, you know, that can continue and be sustainable because it will always be able to grow and change and adapt to whatever is happening in the world and that kind of thing. Is that, am I... My uh, yeah, that. and I can I can uh, <laughs> I can send you citations <laughs> if you want further reading in that matter. Uh, there's a, a <laughs> Paulo Trello, who's a, a, an author. He talks about the two kinds of creativity in the world, and he said one is kind of like architects. You know, they they have a grand plan, they build this enormous thing, but the only relationship they have with it afterwards is entropy. But if mm. you are gardening. You know, it's not as dramatic on a day-to-day basis, but it's constantly changing and growing and, uh, and uh, you know, can live on forever. Yeah, I love that. I think that's a really beautiful sentiment. Um, well, you, you do, I mean, ha- these awards that you guys have gotten, has that gotten you some recognition? I mean, obviously, it's, it is recognition. It's much deserved uh, just for bringing attention to the work that you're doing. Have you, has it moved the needle at all for what you're doing? Have you started getting, Yeah, it, you know, it, it uh, helps. I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, we live in the, uh, 
in a world where more and more people are looking to, to everybody else to see what they recommend. So if you get that affirmation, it kind of <laughs> tells people that it's okay to try this. <laughs> right. Gives them permission to experiment. Um, is it, is, do you find that people's palates are broadening? I mean, they're in Missouri. What, you know, what's the vibe like? Are you, are, are people stuck in, you know, a, a sort of traditional Eurocentric wine thinking um, way I, or the, the, uh, we posit this uh, we haven't had a uh, $200,000 systemic uh, market survey to validate it but <laughs> we, we reason that younger audiences uh, have not quite um, you know ossified their their taste and and uh, there's a lot more exploration going on at that end of the belt of the bell curve or the uh, actually the dumbbell uh, at the other end there's an older audience who's been there, done that. They've gone through the cabs and they are, or some of them are interested in maybe trying something that they haven't had before. So it's a, uh, it's a little bit at both ends. Gotcha. Yeah. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. I, I, I was going to ask, that was going to be my next question of like what your audience was, you know, what, who are you finding is embracing what you're doing more readily? Um, is there a type, I mean, if somebody's like a beer drinker versus a whiskey drinker, do they, does that matter? I mean, do you find having a, a preference for some kind of Actually, something else? Now that you bring that up, I remember one time we had a big group. I think it was like, I don't know, 10 or 12 folks that came by and uh, two gentlemen said that they don't like wine. They just really like their whiskey and their beer. And we made a, so we talked about Wetumpka, how we can make a white pour out of it. We also made a uh, sherry out of it, sherry style out of it. And yeah. because of the fortification and because I don't think they're really privy to, I don't know if they've had very much port in their, you know, in their life, they really liked it. And they're like, wow, this is this. I think they said something along the lines of, wow, this is, uh, I guess, the closest a grape can taste to whiskey. And it just Yeah, because it, it reminded <laughs> me of a single malt scotch. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. That's fascinating. Yeah. That's and, you cool. know, as, as we talk about, you know, people want to experiment with, you know, their taste buds and, you know, all these different wines, that's, that's part of the fun, right? Where it's, uh, if someone doesn't really particularly like whites, it's probably because they haven't had like a full bodied white before. So I kind of lean them in that direction. Or if they are I, getting a feel of what they, what they like, and then kind of, you know, since we have so many wines to choose from and putting, you know, those in front of them, they really kind of find like their, I guess, uh, measurement here. Right. That's, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, I mean, so if people do want to try your wines, what, what's the best way? Let, you know, can we, can we visit, where, can we get you <laughs> online? Do you ship? Yeah, we ship all over the place. Uh, we've actually sold a few wines to Alaska recently. Um yeah, we get a lot of people from California, Texas, New York City, um, all over the place. So we can ship through UPS and we have a third party. Um, so there's a number of ways to do it. You can call us to kind of, what I like to do is get a feel for what um, you know your preferences are. And then as a winemaker, we kind of go through that and kind of choose accordingly for those who are, who've either had it before and haven't had a bunch of the different varietals. Um, obviously visiting the tasting room is super, um, encouraged both tasting rooms, both on site and, uh, off site. And then, um, the website is going through a little bit more of a makeover and we're going to improve it with all this, you know, information that we've talked about. So that's another wealth of knowledge. And as well as our Instagram page, it's always buzzing with new things and, you know, more, I guess, how, how you know, check us out. This is how we get more familiar with us. So to speak. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, and that's voxvineyards.com, right? Yeah. And the Instagram yeah. handle is going to stay the same. It's at Vox vineyards. Okay, great. And but that's the B-O-X. will be Teravox. That one. Yes. Okay. So eventually, yeah. So we'll be, it will be Teravox and this will just resolve to that eventually. Yeah. Um, and that's uh, VOX, and it's right now it's Vineyards with an S. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's already a really beautiful site. So the the fact that you're adding more is even better. But it's a, I mean, it's funny. I, I introduced you to a friend of mine, and they do a lot of online marketing. They're like, somebody knows what they're doing with this website. This is beautiful. And it's really engaging right away, too. So well done on that as well. Well, thanks. Uh, yeah, I mean, basically, we're trying to get the... Um... 
uh, the, the uh, people that more quickly understand what's different and unique about these grapes, not just a, that you know it's a place that makes grapes. So we're trying to move that right. up front a little bit, and also uh, trying to be a little more educational about uh, well about what we're doing and what it's all about. So, well, thanks for preserving all of these varieties, uh, all of this diversity in in what you're doing there, and and I can't wait to drink more of it actually thanks so much well come on by yeah (laughs) i can't wait yeah any closing words guys anything you want to end with in terms of just you know letting people know about you know what what's important about what you're doing um well i don't know i guess tom slowly munson would say you can't just like listen to this on a podcast you gotta actually drink the wine because otherwise you know what's the point i love that (laughs) well perfect thanks a lot guys i appreciate it okay thank you adam thank you very much hey thanks so much for listening if you got as much out of that as i did i would love it if you could give some feedback by giving leaving a rating or review on whatever podcast app you listen to it's super helpful for the podcast to get attention and traction and uh i really value the feedback and want to improve and uh, know how I'm doing. So thank you for those of you who have already left some. I really appreciate that. And please, if you haven't, do leave a review. Thanks so much.